As we mentioned before, like um, those basic common use distributions are like bricks. Like only we have uh, we will have these bricks, we can build out our own houses. So those are very important. So here's the outline of uh, today's talk, today's uh, lecture. First, we're gonna briefly review maximum likelihood estimation. Pretty much what everybody knows that, and then maximum a plus two estimation. And what's the difference between them? And then uh, we'll go through uh, several common use of probability distributions, which are very important to construct more complex uh, uh, probabilistic models, Bayesian models, uh, including binomial and uh, multinomial distributions for binary observations, uh, beta Dirichlet distributions. Those are for uh, distribution of those parameters for binomial and multinomial distributions, and Distributions for continuous random variables, Gaussian distribution, student t distributions, uh, connection between the two distributions, and inverse gamma or gamma distribution, visual distribution, inverse visual distribution, these can be considered as the prior distribution for the uh, uh, inverse variance or uh, inverse coherence of the Gaussian distribution. So, first, let us uh, uh, Let's review what is the maximum light estimation and map estimation. So, uh, suppose we have a distribution. 
right? And then we know that we know the form of this distribution, and we know that the distribution is parameterized by some uh, unknown parameters theta. And now we have observed a set of independent, identically distributed, briefly ID, random variables from this distribution. Right? So basically, we have observed a set of observations, and we can assume we can safely assume those observations are ID. And the question is that how do we estimate data from these observations D, which consists of like say n points, right? How do we do that? And have you? How do I estimate these parameters? set of uh, observations or data, how do you estimate the model? The first choice is maximal likelihood estimation. Right? It's a very fundamental method. So basically, what is likelihood? Likelihood is just the probability density evaluated at each observation. It's called likelihood. Uh, why is not called probability? Because I have observed those data points. I just want to evaluate how likely it was generated. That's, that's why it's called likelihood. Of course, if your observation is kind of discrete, um, then it's not appropriate to say this is a density function, we call it a mass function. But essentially, uh, they have the same meaning. And then, given the set of, uh, uh, say, n observations, how do we identify the optimal parameters for those distributions? We find theta right? that maximizes the likelihood of all the observations. <coughs> So the idea is that the underlying assumption or idea is that now that I have observed those n observations, I assume the underlying distribution which generates the observations must have a larger chance to make them appear, right? In other words, if something or some event uh, has very small chance to happen, then you cannot observe them in practice unless you observe like one million times or a billion times. So this is a key idea of the maximal likelihood estimation. And then we can basically turn the uh, estimation problem into an optimization problem. We maximize the likelihood of all the n data points. As we just mentioned, because those data points are ID, right? So the total likelihood is just the product of the likelihood for each single data point. And any question at this point? I think this is, everybody knows that, right? So if you if you are uncomfortable, just let me know. So, um, but usually uh, we when we do the optimization, we do not like to deal with this uh, product, right? The product of many many terms, which is less than one, uh, you you will incur some numerical instability uh, issue. So usually we take logarithm over this uh, likelihood, and when we take logarithm, now it becomes a summation over the log, the log likelihood of each single data point. So we maximize the log likelihood to find out the optimal um, distribution parameters. Right? But what is the problem of maximum likelihood estimation? <coughs> We're doing Bayesian, right? So in Bayesian world, we always assume some prior distribution, our prior, which encodes our prior knowledge of beliefs uh, on for the uh, model parameters. If you just do the uh, MLE, maximum likelihood estimation, they won't take into account the uh, prior knowledge. So that comes the uh, map estimation, maximum a posterior estimation. So basically, in the map estimation, we're not only maximizing the likelihood of the data, 
We also consider the effect of the torque. Then we maximize the joint distribution of the uh, model parameters, of distribution parameters, and the data likelihood. This is joint distribution of the model parameters and data. Right? And again, we can take logarithm because for any objective function, you take logarithm, uh, it doesn't affect your 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 your, your goal for optimization. It doesn't change because logarithm is monotonic uh, increasing function. Doesn't matter, right? And then your objective to uh, maximize now becomes logarithm of the bar plus the log likelihood over all the observations. Right? So the only difference between the map estimation and the maximal maximal uh, MLE estimation is this uh, log bar term when you do the optimization. And there's an interesting connection between this uh, map framework and uh, the regularization framework in non-Bayesian view. In non-Bayesian view, uh, those guys uh, always claim that how to avoid overfitting, how to uh, incorporate domain knowledge, they introduce a so-called term, regularizing. Uh, for example, if I want to select features, right, I, if I apply lasso or elastinet, I actually add L1 regularizer. I encourage the feature width to be zero. So we not only minimize the mean square error of the prediction, but also uh, encourage the feature width to be exactly zero. So the term that encourages the feature width to be zero is, is called L1 regularizer. But they have they have the counterpart in Bayesian work. Is that it is actually the logarithm of the Laplace wire. So this is kind of a, a interesting uh, connection between the commonly used uh, regularizer and the uh, log prior on the invasion work. And although map estimation looks uh, a good way to incorporate prior knowledge because we take into account not only the data emission but also our prior beliefs of prior knowledge, but it's still not ideal uh, from a basic perspective. The reason is that in Bayesian work, we always want to compute the posterior distribution rather than some single point. The posterior distribution is proportional to the prior distribution multiplying with the data likelihood, right? So this is a distribution, it's not point. And then how does the map estimation connect to the posterior distribution? Remember, map estimation is to maximize this part, right? We just want to find a single point which maximizes this uh, uh, joint distribution. That means that uh, your map estimation is actually some uh, mode of posterior distribution. So among the mode complex, uh, among the, uh, uh, the complex chip of the uh, posterior distribution, you find out a point which achieves the maximum value of the posterior distribution or posterior density. Right? Any question? Everyone is comfortable. Okay, and but be careful because uh, the posterior distribution could have could be like multi-modality. Right? It could have many modes. That means if you do the map estimation, uh, really it's not convex function. When you do the uh, not convex compute function, when you do the maximization, you may end up with different local maximum. That's 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 possible. Okay. So. Uh, just be clear about the connection between the map estimation and the posterior distribution. So in a nutshell, map estimation is just the mode of the posterior distribution. Uh -huh. what, what do you mean by mode? Mode is just uh, the uh, uh, local maximum of your probability density. So basically, what is the mode for Gaussian distribution? If it's for standard Gaussian distribution, it's just a zero, right? If we're like a non-standard Gaussian distribution, it achieves the maximum density at the expectation, right? Uh -huh. so, so this picture, uh, it actually has two... Yeah, we have two modes. That's called multimodality. So how does it choose one over another? Oh, that depends. Like if you use, if it's uh, like not concave function, and you do the optimization, it depends on 
say, the initialization you choose. Also, depends on the step size you're searching over the uh, parameter space. It may trap, it may be trapped in some local maximum, or it may go through, uh, go over and the search search and the final at the global uh, maximum. It depends. It depends on what kind of optimization algorithm you choose. Right? So if you choose like global optimization algorithm like simulated annealing, you guarantee that when the time approaches to infinity, you always end up with a global maximum, but practically it's useless. Right? In many cases, you just choose gradient-based approaches, then most of the cases just guarantee a, a local, local maximum. Any question? Okay, so uh, yeah, just a fast review of the MLE and the map estimation. And then we're going to go through uh, a set of common just for three distributions. Pretty much for many of them, you're familiar with, you have a deal with, so I'll be uh, quite fast. So <clears throat> again, I want to uh, emphasize that those distributions will be used everywhere. All kinds of statistics, uh, statistical applications, Bayesian applications, non Bayesian applications, they are everywhere. So uh, they are building blocks to construct more complex probability models. So uh, uh, that means uh, you should be very familiar with that. Uh, you are not required to memorize every formula, but you should keep in mind there are such kind of uh, uh, distributions, and whenever you want to use it, you can just uh, pick them up from, say, Wikipedia or whatever statistical uh, textbooks. Okay. So uh, let us start with the final variable. So suppose um, we want to deal with a set of variables which are either 0 or 1, right? just find them. Then what kind of distributions can we have for those uh, finding the variables? Bonoli, right? So Bonoli pro uh, probably is the, the, the simplest uh, distribution. Right? So just like toss a coin, right? or you decide whether you purchase this uh, back or not, final decision, then I I can assign a Bernoulli distribution to describe the random variable. The Bernoulli distribution is determined by a single parameter, scalar mu, which actually represents the chance that your variable taking one. Right? And then we can write down the uh, density of the Bernoulli distribution, a Bernoulli variable, as mu to x multiply with 1 minus mu to 1 minus x, right? So here, you should be aware that x is either 1 or 0. So when x is 1, then the density or the mass is mu, right? When x is 0, then, then mu to 0 becomes 1, and then the remaining part will be 1 minus mu. And then based on this uh, uh, density function, we can calculate the expectation of, uh, uh, of the binary variable on the Bonoli distribution, right? So the expectation will be simply the simple mu, right? The chance of that variable taking one. And the variance will be mu times one minus mu. Any question? And then we can uh, consider how do we estimate the parameters for uh, a Bonoli distribution, right? Um, say in the MLE framework, suppose we have uh, n ID observations n points, x1, xn, so n binary observations, right? And then what is the maximal likelihood estimation of mu? How to do that? Just apply the way to calculate to do that MLE, right? You, you first compute the uh, likelihood for all the data points because those are IDs, so uh, you just uh, substitute this uh, likelihood. Um, uh, you just substitute for this likelihood by this uh, mu to xn uh, multiplying with mi y minus mu to y minus xn, right? And because they are, those xn are all, all on the exponents, you just add them together, right? And you take a logarithm and uh, you set the gradient of the logarithm to be zero, it turns out maximum likelihood estimation of mu is just the uh, average of all the uh, binary, binary observations. So this is a simple, this is, a, this, is a, uh, this is consistent with our intuition, right? You just count. We just count number of whites in observations and divide it by total number of counts. That is ratio of whites. Ratio of whites is maximum likelihood estimation of the chance your variable taking one. It's very uh, intuitive. 
Our boy is good. Okay. So now let us try to extend uh, the binomial distribution to the binomial distribution. So binomial distribution means that okay, uh, if I know some random experiments and uh, they are governed by the binomial distribution. So what if I independently try this uh, uh, binomial experiments multiple times and how many ones I can observe? This is the meaning of the binomial distribution. So um, it is just to repeat repeated binomial experiments for n times. So the binomial distribution is governed by two parameters. First, the number of the number of experiments you conduct, and then the parameters for the underlying binomial distribution in the middle. And uh, then the observation now becomes a count. The number of the ones in among those n uh, experiments, right? So it ranges from 0, 1, 2 to a big n. Because you conduct n experiments, you at most observe n ones. And the density of this uh, binomial distribution is simply <coughs> first you need to uh, calculate how many combinations. All of, all, all, all of, from, all of the, like, n experiments, how many, uh, which, which set of uh, uh, experiments you, you are going to observe one, right? That's why there is a combination here. And then given, that, given the specific setting, one, zero, one, zero uh, sequence, right? Their likelihood is, is simply uh, the corresponding one only likelihood, right? So mu to the x, one minus mu, n minus x. And uh, you can accordingly calculate the expectation of a binomial distribution in various ways. So, of course, you can calculate the expectation uh, following this. That's no problem. This original density. But usually, there is a even uh, there is a uh, a better trick to calculate. We can re-express the uh, binomial random variable as a summation of n independent. Uh, Bonoli variable, right? Because it's just a count of ones, right? If it's so zero, it doesn't count. And then we can use the uh, linearity of the expectation. The expectation of a summation of random variables is a summation of the expectation of those random variables. You immediately get the uh, expectation of the uh, uh, binomial distributions, which is n times mu, right? And similarly, you can compute variance of the uh, the summation of the uh, binomial random variables. So I believe everybody has done such kind of work, right? You're required to like, toss a coin like 20 times and compute maximum likelihood and blah, 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 right? So, yeah. So now let us consider a uh, more general case. Suppose we have a categorical variable. That means uh, I have a random variable which are discrete, which can take more than two values, right? Say k values. How can we define a probability distribution over this uh, categorical variable? It's similar to Bonoi, right? We introduce a. Uh, oh, first, uh, first I need to uh, emphasize how we usually represent the categorical variable. So uh, intuitively, it will be like I said, uh, uh, integer, positive integer to represent the value of the categorical variable. Say, I have four categories, then your variable value could be one, two, three, four, right? That's very intuitive. But for the convenience of the statistical inference and probabilistic modeling, we usually we usually use a k-dimensional vector to represent the categorical variable. And in this k-dimensional vector, there is only one element can take one. All the remaining elements are zero. So only one entry can be one, others are zero. This is called a one hot encoding, a one hot vector. So this is a heavily used uh, name in the deep learning uh, literature. Those deep learning guys would love to invent some uh, you know, cool name on that. But this, uh, this kind of representation is used like for 100 years or 200 years. So to give a detailed uh, concrete example, like if I have uh, like four categories, and uh, if you observe 
the observation is category two, they will represent the observation as zero, one, zero, zero. So you say that only the second element is one, right? all the remaining elements are zero. Uh, it will be very convenient when we deal with uh, uh, like discrete uh, distributions or those models involve hierarchical discrete, discrete distributions like latent Dirichlet allocation topic models. And then let us uh, look at how we uh, uh, assign a distribution of a categorical uh, variable. So basically, we we'll introduce a uh, k distribution parameters. So mu one, mu k. So this is a k-dimensional vector. So each element in this vector represent the chance that the variable taking the corresponding category. So mu1 is the chance that the variable taking category 1 and mu2 category 2 until mu k, right? So now we see we should uh, put some constraint on this distribu distribution parameter, right? So first, the chance of each uh, the chance of taking some specific category should be a uh, non empty right? And then the summation of all the chances must be one. And then with this uh, constraint, we can write down the distribution or the probability density of your categorical variable as a product right? over one, uh, from one to k, and uh, mu k to x k. So remember, x k is a one half vector, right? Only one element is one, right? For the, for the remaining uh, zero elements, mu k, the other mu k is to zero is just one, right? So here it just means, okay, whatever um, category it takes, uh, its value will be the corresponding chance value in the mu vector. Right? And then, again, if we have observed like n i v observations, say x1 to xn, right? So remember, uh, uh, keep it in mind that each vector in observation is a k dimension vector, one half vector. Among those vectors, uh, only one element uh, in each, each vector is one, others are zero. <clears throat> it's not a sequence of the natural numbers like one, two, three, four. It's just it's a sequence of k dimension vectors. And then we can write down the drawn probability, and again, this just replace the, uh, the the Bonoli distribution to the uh, to the to the to the categorical distribution. It's still uh, uh, mu k to some x one, right? And all of, because they are all on the exponents, and then we can do the summation, and then uh, then merge those uh, uh, merge these terms uh, into a product of k terms, and then you take logarithm, you get log likelihood. But when you do the maximum likelihood estimation, you need to uh, incorporate the constraint, right? You need to ensure that the summation of all the mu k's must be one. That's a constraint we just mentioned. Right? You need to ensure that. The chance that you're taking category one plus the chance you're taking category two until the chance you're taking category k must be one. It cannot be bigger than one. It cannot be less than one. Everyone is, is comfortable, right? What? Yeah. Here? This one? Yeah. Oh, this is a. This is a go through the n data points, right? And for each particular data point, the likelihood is written as this uh, product. Right? So there's a double product. Does it make sense? So this is a this is a this is a likelihood for one single data point, right? So now you have a n observations. So you capture their likelihood, you must multiply them together. Yeah, because because you know, for all the data points, they share this mu k to something, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you multiply them together, uh, all those uh, observations are on x exponent, right? You multiply them together, you just uh, the e to merge the exponent, just add them together. Mm -hmm. And don't don't forget that because I have to put extra constraints. So uh, when I take a logarithm, I have to add a Lagrange multiplier. Okay. And I saw this uh, uh, log likelihood with Lagrange multipliers. Take the derivative, uh, take the gradient, and set gradient to zero, and you get maximum likelihood like this, right? Each mu k is just uh, the number of the uh, variables taking category k over the total number of observations. 
So it's just a ratio of each category. So it's still very intuitive. So similarly, we can extend the uh, <coughs> categorical distribution to the multi-nominal distribution. So what is not multi-nominal distribution? Again, I do the random experiments. I know the experiment is controlled by the categorical distributions. I do it independently for, for n times, right? Now I want to observe how many uh, observations are in <coughs> category 1, how many observations are in category 2, how many uh, observations are in category, categorical, uh, category k. Right? So, so now the observations is uh, a count factor. Say 1, 2, 3, 4, or 4, 2, 1, 3. So it's not one whole factor. It's a count factor. So among all n experiments, how many um, variables turn out to be in category one? Right? How many turn out to be category two? <laughs> and then the likelihood is very similar to the binomial form. Right? First, I need to uh, count how many combinations that among uh, these uh, n experiments, which experiments all counts will be uh, M one will be the will be the first category, and then which second category and until which are kid category. So this is a, a, combina uh, a combination number. And then given this particular setting of the uh, uh, categories appear in one single experiment, the likelihood will follow the standard categorical distribution. Right? And then again, when you, uh, again, you can take a logarithm, you can do the uh, calculate expectation, but you can use the trick we mentioned before. Right? To do the to to calculate expectation variance. So <clears throat> how the categorical variables uh, are used in machine learning models. So suppose we have a, a set of uh, uh, observations which are category, which are binary or uh, or, or category or one two three four or whatever. These are very common in real world. Right? How do we build up a model on top of that? So here's the uh, here's the trick. Right? So basically, the machine machine learning model will focus on how to express the distribution parameters. So if you're binary, you know the binary variables is uh, the distribution of binary variable is parameterized by this scalar mu, right? If it's categorical, is categorical, then it is uh, controlled by the uh, vector of the probabilities that each that that each category can be taken. Then the art will be how do you model them as uh, some kind of functions uh, in terms of some feature vector. So you commonly use the um, model like logistic regression. You want to model how the binary labels are generated right? and given some feature vector. Then I model the uh, well, only parameter mu as uh, a sigmoid activation function. And where the input of sigma is the inner product of some uh, feature weight vector and the, and the feature vector. And similarly, you have a like, probability regression, then you replace this uh, uh, sigma with Gaussian CDF, standard Gaussian CDF. And for multi class classification, for multi class classification, then you may introduce, say, if you have a big K categories, then you may introduce uh, K feature vectors, and you take exponential to ensure the positiveness. And then normalize it, you get each mu1, mu2 to mu k. This is also called softmax. And ordinal regression, if you want to do the ranking, then probably you can define mu k as the integral over some specific region. Uh, and uh, uh, the integrand is a parameterized the Gaussian, and the mu, the, the mean of the Gaussian mm -hmm. is determined by the inner product between the feature vector and uh, the feature weight vector. So just to give you a hint that how those uh, distributions are linked to commonly used uh, uh, probabilistic models or machine learning models. So now, suppose we're given some uh, discrete distributions to model those discrete variables, right? So we want to ask, can we have some uh, prior distribution over the distribution parameters? See, if you have, a, if you have a, like a, a Bonoli distribution, we know this Bonoli distribution is determined by 
uh, this mu, right? This mu is between 0 and 1, representing how likely you will end up with uh, 1, observation 1, right? And the question now, in the Bayesian work, can we assign some far distribution over mu? The answer is yes, and this distribution is called beta distribution. The beta distribution will guarantee to sample a scalar which is between 0 and 1. So this is a form of beta distribution. So the beta distribution is determined by two scalars A and B, and both A and B must be um, positive. And this is a form, this is a gamma function. So gamma function of A plus B over gamma A times gamma B, and then mu to the power of A minus 1 times 1 minus mu to the power of B minus 1. So what is gamma function? So in general, you can consider yourself like a generalized version of the factorial. So if uh, if you take A to be like integral, right, a positive integral, then gamma A is uh, the same as uh, the factorial of uh, A minus 1. So also gamma function has a has very good property, like gamma 1 is 1, and then gamma A is A minus 1, gamma A minus 1. So you just consider it as like continuous version of factorial. And here's the uh, uh, examples of uh, the density of beta distributions with different choices A and B. So you can see the curve of the density functions rely heavily on your choice of A and B. And this is the uh, uh, expectation and variance of uh, the uh, beta distribution. So in some sense, because the expectation of your mu is A or A plus B, so some, in some sense you can consider as a uh, uh, you do some pseudo experiments. You do the pseudo experiments for a plus b times, and you observe the a positive positive observations. But here a and b can both be continuous. So <clears throat> beta distribution is a conjugate prior to the Bernoulli likelihood, and it's very useful. And uh, so what is conjugate prior? And we'll discuss later. So now let us switch to the categorical distribution. Right? So again, as we just mentioned, right, we can use uh, parameter vectors. So if we have k possible categories, then we use a k-dimensional uh, vector mu, mu1 to mu k, to uh, uh, determine the categorical distribution. Right? Then a natural question will be, can we have a prior distribution over this parameter vector mu? So this parameter vector has some uh, special constraint. That is, each element must be a uh, on Neptune, and their summation must be what? Right. We have such kind of a prior distribution, which is called Dirichlet distribution. So here's the form of uh, the Dirichlet distribution. And again, the Dirichlet distribution is governed by um, another k-dimension vector, it's called alpha. And uh, we, uh, alpha is also called concentration parameter, and each element of alpha must be uh, positive. And here is the uh, general form of the Dirichlet distribution, and you know you can see that the coefficient now becomes uh, uh, the gamma function of alpha zero. Alpha zero is the summation of all the alpha values in this alpha vector, and divided by the product of the gamma function over each alpha elements. Then multiplying this uh, uh, product over each mu k to the power of alpha k minus one. So uh, it is easy to see that. Um, this is essentially a generalized version of beta distribution. Right? So if you reduce the number of categories to two, you'll reduce to beta distribution. So uh, geometrically speaking, um, the sample space of the Dirichlet distribution actually consists of uh, a simplex. A simplex, uh, for example, if, uh, if uh, our category is three, number of categories is three, then every time just uh, uh, sample of points in three dimensional space, right? And but we must ensure that those points, uh, the coordinates of all the points, their summation must be one and it must be a positive. You know, the radius space it corresponds to a simplex constrained by this uh, half a plane and with a constraint that uh, each uh, coordinate must be non active. And beta distribution is a special case of this uh, distribution when k equals to 2. 
and uh, the uh, expectation of the Dirichlet distribution. So expectation on each element mu k, so k is element to the mu vector, right? It is alpha k over the summation of all the alpha values. And here's here's one simple, uh, one interesting uh, uh, conclusion I want to mention here because this, this, this is heavily used. So the expectation of logarithm of mu k, which is a like gamma function of the corresponding alpha k, minus uh, the diagonal function over the summation of all the uh, alpha k's. So here is the definition of the gamma function. It's the derivative of, of the logarithm of the gamma function. But you don't need to worry about how to compute this. And uh, uh, it's, it, it's not analytical. And when we use that, there is always like a mature numerical algorithm to give you the values. But keep in mind, uh, this function is called diagonal. Right. The original distribution is a conjugate prior to the categorical likelihood, and we'll discuss later as well. And what's the usage of the original distribution? So, uh, about like, uh, 15, 15 years ago, uh, there's a very popular um, model, it's called the uh, latent Dirichlet allocation, or often referred to as popping models. So they are very useful, and uh, until now, they are very useful. Its aim is to uh, extract a set of topics from uh, tax coppers. So you say you have a like tax of top coppers. You may say, okay, this uh, set of documentation may cover topics like politics, uh, like uh, uh, sports, like arts, whatever, right? So how do you uh, develop an algorithm that can automatically extract these topics? This model called latent Dirichlet allocation is a uh, such model, it's very widely used in uh, uh, industry. And so this is just one example. Right? Among those uh, words in the document, they extract the topics and copy words. Right? You can say those words are well consistent with the topic. Right? And this model is based on a hierarchical um, structure where the Dirichlet, uh, Dirichlet distribution takes the table. So we have a review of the uh, general variable and uh, categorical variables. Now let's, let us uh, uh, turn to the run uh, continuous variables. So what is the most commonly used uh, distribution for the continuous run variable? The Gaussian distribution, right? So everyone knows that. And here is the uh, uh, density for the single variable Gaussian distribution. So I hope uh, everybody um, knows that, and everybody can memorize it. You can forget all of the other forms of distributions, but don't forget this. So basically, uh, a, Gaussian, a, a scalar Gaussian distribution is determined by two parameters. One is called the expectation parameter, or mean parameter, and the other is called the uh, uh, variance parameter. Right? Given the mean variance, you can determine the whole Gaussian distribution. This is for the scalar case. and uh, but the more important should be the multivariate case. So I hope everybody uh, will be very familiar with this multivariate uh, Gaussian distribution. So a multivariate Gaussian distribution is determined by two parameters as well. One is called the expectation vector, a mean vector. The other is called covariance matrix. So here is the general form of the multivariate Gaussian distribution. So the first term is uh, 2 pi times this covariance matrix and take the determinant and to the power of uh, uh, negative 1 over 2, right? And then exponential. The exponent will be a quadratic form, which is, uh, oh, sorry, oh, there's something wrong here. Um, I think I should correct it. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't write down the uh, solution. In general, this is not like this. This is a, 
x minus mu transpose sigma inverse x minus mu. Okay? And then, remember, this is scalar. Right? So we can also write down as a trace, because the trace of scalar is still a scalar. So when we do the trace, We can rotate terms in the product inside the trace, right? So we can move here to the left most. The same thing. So you end up with a trace x minus mu x minus mu transpose sigma inverse. This is a property of trace operation. So now it becomes a you first do the matrix product and two two matrix product and then they take the trace. But it is essentially the same as this uh, uh, quadratic, quadratic form. So this will be useful when you do the um, uh, approx uh, approximations like variation inference. You need to compute the expectation of this part. It turns out to be the covariance of the approximate theory. So Sometimes we also parameterize the multivariate Gaussian distribution with the inverse of the covariance matrix. So we call the inverse of covariance matrix as a precision matrix. So whenever you find some literature say I'm doing, I'm, I'm estimating is precision or I do some operations on precision, it's actually talking about the inverse of covariance matrix. So here is just uh, uh, some uh, uh, examples of the uh, uh, 2D Gaussian distribution. So uh, if you choose uh, the covariance identity, it's just like this. It's a, it's a normal circle, right? And uh, if you choose different variants along you know, the x-axis, y-axis, you may have a different stretch in the two axes. And, but if it's diagonal, that means you don't have correlations between uh, the two axes, then you still have this uh, um, well placed uh, uh, ellipses, right? But if you have some correlations, then your ellipses will be kind of inclined. Okay. And some something, some fact you need to memorize. First, the expectation of the multivariate Gaussian just mu. And the expectation of the auto product of the vector x, x x transpose will be a, the auto product of the mean vector plus the covariance matrix. This is a very basic, right? And then <clears throat> given ID observations, so suppose you are given like n vectors, and how do you estimate the mean and covariance for the Gaussian distribution? So this is something, this is a good practice for you to take the matrix and vector of uh, your chips. So uh, I will not put it in the homework, but I highly suggest you to uh, do that by your hand. Okay. So first, I, I can take a logarithm of the uh, multivariate Gaussian distribution. It end up with this, right? Remember, the drawn distribution will be uh, the, 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 the distribution of this vector, the beta microphone will be go through all the beta points, and for each the point is to have this uh, 2 pi sigma determined to the power uh, minus 1 over 2 exponential to this. <coughs> is it clear, everybody? And then you think of algorithm just like this. And uh, those are constant, right? And uh, those are because uh, the uh, law of determinant will appear in each all the observations to just uh, multiply uh, it for n times, and these are a summation of this quadratic in the exponent theorem. Right? And from this log likelihood, you will see that to determine the estimate of the mu and sigma, you only need the summation of all the uh, observations, and also the summation of all the of all the observations. These are called sufficient statistics. Someone mentioned that in the 
as a whole, right? So uh, basically, what is sufficient statistics? It is basically can be considered as a summary of your data. So you do not to uh, store the whole data. As long as you have sufficient statistics, you can use it to recover the distribution. So to do the uh, MLE for the, uh, uh, for the uh, mean parameter, we can take a uh, gradient of the log likelihood with respect to a uh, mu, right? And uh, if you take a partial derivative, OK, these terms are constant, right? You only need to take the derivative over this term. And uh, if I have a practice the uh, how to do the uh, matrix of vector derivative, you'll say, OK, this is a quadratic term. So it will be 2 sigma inverse x minus mu, right? And then apply the chain rule because you have a negative sign here, so you have to put a sign here. And the negative, negative become positive, and you have 2, 2, cancel. So now you know this, this gradient. And now you set the gradient to be 0. Remember, sigma inverse is positive one. Definitely shared by all the sum, and just uh, you can just uh, remove it. So now you solve it, you get the result, right? So the, the uh, maximum likelihood estimation uh, of the mean vector is just the average of the, all the observations. So now, if we take, if you want to get maximum likelihood estimation of for the uh, Covariance matrix, sigma. Again, we take the derivative with respect to sigma. So we can say, uh, let, let us say which terms relate to sigma. Right? First, it's log, whichever term, right? So you should you should at least remember uh, this uh, known inclusion. So the determinant, the derivative of the log determinant is trace of the uh, inverse of the matrix. Times the derivative of the matrix. And for this one, you should use the conclusion that the derivative of the inverse is minus sigma inverse derivative of sigma and sigma inverse. And here, you can use the trace patterns because it's a trace. So you apply the uh, derivative inside. You have a sigma inverse d sigma sigma inverse, and you put the negative sign outside. The negative negative and positive, and times x n minus mu. So now to get the derivative, you need to move. This part into the leftmost of the this one. Then in front of this d sigma is the derivative, or it's the gradient, whatever it is called. Then you end up with this. Everyone is comfortable with this, right? I just tell you how you do that, and I strongly recommend you to uh, follow what, what I've done and to get this. And then you set the gradient to zero, you end up with you end up with this result. So basically, the uh, maximum likelihood estimation is an uh, average of the output product for each observation. The output product is over the difference between the observation xn and the uh, uh, MLE for the event. So here's the interesting regarding the MLA estimation for Gaussian distribution. If you take the expectation over your MLE for the mean, it is the original mean, right? But if you take expectation over the MLE estimator for the coerce, it is not the true coerce. It's actually uh, skewed by this n minus 1 over n. With that being said, the MLE estimator for coerce is not a, uh, is not an unbiased estimator. It's a biased estimator. It's a known result. 
for the MLA estimator for the uh, for the for the Gaussian distribution. So MLA estimator has many uh, good properties, like a sympathetic properties uh, of the unbiased estimate, but there can be some exceptions. And for Gaussian distribution, this is a, a known exception. And the question is that uh, why do we get this? Uh, I'm not going to show the details, I'll just give you a hint. And probably I'll include this in your homework assignments. So, the idea is simple, right? Let us try to take this expectation over this. So, but you, if, you, if you directly take expectation over this, uh, it's hard. It's kind of uh, not very obvious to arrive at this. So, I will give you a hint. I can uh, insert the true. Uh, vector, true mean vector mu here. I add a uh, true mean vector and minus true mean vector. So now I can convert this as a x mean minus mu plus mu minus uh, the MLP estimator for the mu. And again, do this again. X minus mu plus mu minus uh, the ML estimator. Is it clear for everyone? Does that look good? Anybody? Uh, anyone feel uh, not very clear? I can, I can write down in another place. Sure. Okay. So uh, let me write down here. So still from this term, right? So I can rewrite the uh, further as x n minus mu plus mu minus uh, the mu ml, which is the ml estimate for the mu, right? And then times xn minus mu plus mu minus mu ml transpose. Does it make sense? Not visible. What? It's visible. <laughs> yeah, it's visible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it makes sense, right? I add term and minus term. Yeah. Doesn't, 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 doesn't change. Uh, that change the result. Then, what do you need? Is to uh, expand this, expand this, and then do the expectation. You will arrive at you will arrive at this conclusion. So from this conclusion, we can immediately get the unbiased estimate of the course. That is, you need to uh, divide this submission over n minus 1 rather than n. From this, you can drop, obtain uh, this immediately. So now let us go to uh, an important topic I want to emphasize. So uh, suppose we partition the uh, vector into two parts, two subvectors, uh, xA and xB xA and xB, right? And uh, uh, correspondingly, we can partition the mean vector, mu A and mu B, and uh, partition the whole coarse matrix into four blocks, sigma AA, sigma AB, sigma BA, and sigma BB, right? And then, corresponding, if we want to parameterize this distribution uh, with the precision matrix, so we have a corresponding blocks in the precision matrix. That's lambda AA, lambda AB, lambda BA, and lambda BB, right? The question is that, how can we compute the condition distribution of xA given xB? So probably everyone knows that that will be another Gaussian distribution, right? But the issue is that how do you arrive at that Gaussian distribution? Rather than just look up the dictionary, right? can you derive the condition Gaussian distribution given its uh, joint Gaussian distribution? So to do that, we need to use this uh, trick called uh, square completion or completing the squares. Why I emphasize this point? Because uh, uh, you will heavily use this trick in probabilistic inference. Because in many cases, like when posterior inference is too difficult to compute, we need to approximate the true posterior with some knowing and uh, well-behaved distribution 
such as Gaussian distribution. And how do we find the best uh, Gaussian distribution to, approx to approximate the true posterior? We often need to use this completing square trick to find the good, the best mu and sigma. That's why I emphasize here. So the first observation is that for any Gaussian description, if you look at the exponent, exponent right, and in this quadratic form, right, we'll expand it. We'll look at terms which regard the vector x. It only consists of two types of terms. One term is called the graphic term, which is x transpose x, uh, sigma inverse x. Right? If, you do, if you expand, expand this. The other term is uh, x transpose sigma inverse mu. So the first term is quadratic to x. The second term is linear to x. Remember, this is just an inner product between x and this vector, right? Sigma inverse mu is vector. That means if we want to uh, find out another Gaussian distribution, we want to find out its corresponding sigma and mu, we we'll only need to identify which is the matrix in the quadratic term, which is the vector in the linear term. Then we can we can we can map back to the corresponding mu and sigma. Okay. For the condition Gaussian, we use the same trick. So let us uh, try to extend the partition uh, variables. Right? So this is a full vector. And let me write down it as a partition version. So it becomes uh, 1 over 2. So that will be xA, xB minus mu A. And transpose, so sigma inverse is not precision, right? We use a gloss, block version of the precision index. And then, then we This uh, lambda a x a minus mu a. So we can see x a here and x a here, right? So this is a quadratic. So we know, okay, the covariance uh, of the conditional distribution must be inverse of this sigma a, uh, not sigma, lambda a. Okay. Then uh, something a little more tedious is to find the. Uh, yeah, uh, so given this quadratic term, we can immediately identify. The conditional covariance, which is the inverse of the uh, lambda a, and the little tedious thing is to uh, identify the linear term. Right? So it turns out that the linear term is just uh, uh, inside three terms, three uh, product. So the first one is come here. So you can see mu a transpose lambda a a then times x a. Right? This is the first linear term. It actually appears twice because. You multiply xA, of course, 
do the transpose and then, and then, then you the module drive is sitting my AA and the AA here. So it actually twice. And similarly you can find in this term, like XA transpose times this. And this term, uh, XB minus mu B transpose lambda B A times X A. You just merge them together, you get this linear term. And you don't need to uh, use your eye to infer this. Just catch the idea. Because later you can you can you can you can repeat this procedure. So now we know for a general Gaussian description, the exponent in the the exponent in the uh, in exponential term, it has a, a linear term and a projective term. So a linear term will have this form. And now we know this vector is represented in this way, right? So now we just map it back. We have a the conditional covariance inverse times conditional mean equals to this term. And then we know the conditional covariance is inverse of a lambda a, right? This is something we just uh, uh, we arrived at the very first time, at the very beginning. And we just uh, applied it there. So because this is a inverse of lambda AA tensor, and just multiply into this term, you get the result here. This is conditional mean or conditional expectation. A given B, which is mu A minus uh, lambda AA inverse lambda AB times XB minus mu A. So, so now we got the form of conditional Gaussian distribution, and uh, we have the form for the uh, conditional covariance. And uh, <coughs> the problem is that sometimes we also we want to capitalize with the covariance, with the uh, covariance matrix from the previous, uh, from the original distribution. We do not want to use precision matrix. And then the question is how can we convert those precision matrix into the corresponding parts of representation in terms of the and we need to use uh, so this is a method, right? This is a method. Now how we map it then back, we need to use the uh, block matrix inverse and half. So here's the uh, again you're not required to memorize it. Right? But whenever you want to use it, just look up uh, Wikipedia or look up the web. So so basically if you have like invertible matrix and, and you have the blocks and ensure that the diagonal blocks are a square matrix, then you can get the inverse matrix and uh, the form of each block in, 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 in the matrix inverse will be like this. So M is A minus B, B inverse times C. So it's just like a rotation, like clockwise rotation. A first, then minus B times B inverse C. You get M. And then you can calculate each block matrix in the universe. So now we can just uh, substitute the results for those uh, for those uh, uh, for, for, for our for our uh, multivariate gas in case. So we immediately get lambda A A is this sigma A A minus uh, sigma A B uh, sigma B B inverse and sigma B A. And similarly you can obtain uh, lambda A B and then you substitute them back for our conditional gas distribution, we finally we end up with uh, the form of the conditional mean and conditional, uh, conditional covariance. That's the formula you often say in Wikipedia or textbooks. So, <clears throat> using the same trick, we can derive the margin distribution. Say, we have a partition. Run the variables x a and x b, right? So we know the joint distribution will be this multivariate Gaussian distribution. Then what is the marginal distribution of x a? Just a sub vector. According to the definition, we can do that by marginalizing out x b, right? The question is how can you marginalize out? And we know after marginalization, you end up with another Gaussian and with covariance to be sigma a and uh, mean to be mu a. I'll leave it as an exercise for you because uh, it uses the same trick. 
Again, I want to emphasize this because I want that everybody knows how to derive that because this is a square completion trick um, is everywhere in approximate inference. So uh, let's go back to the, uh, to the slides. So let us talk about gamma distribution. So <clears throat> when we have a scalar Gaussian distribution, we have a, a mu and a sigma square, right? The question is that, do we have a prior distribution over its coherence, or inverse of its uh, inverse of its variance? It is called precision, right? And such prior distribution is called gamma distribution. And this is the form of gamma distribution. Gamma distribution guarantees to uh, sample a positive number. So that's why it can be used as the prior of the inverse variance for Gaussian for scalar Gaussian distribution. And uh, <coughs> Again, gamma distribution is determined by two parameters, A and B, both must be positive, and this expectation varies. And uh, again, if you want to calculate the logarithm of the gamma variable, A, you need to involve the gamma function as well. But those are just the known results. You are not required to know how to derive or arrive at this. And this uh, uh, some examples of the density of gamma distribution, we will choose different A and B. And if a random variable follows a gamma distribution, then the inverse of the random variable follows a distribution called inverse gamma distribution. So it's kind of uh, it's kind of uh, uh, like redundant, right? But it is useful for different customs. So some people, like when I Build up a hierarchical basic model. I want to assign the prior over the inverse coherence, inverse uh, inverse variance. Then I use gamma prior. But somebody feel like I am more comfortable to assign prior over the variance. Then what kind of distribution I want to use? Inverse gamma. Now let us switch to the multivariate Gaussian distribution. So again, for multivariate Gaussian distribution, we have a coherence matrix. Then the natural question would be, can we have a distribution over the precision matrix? That is the inverse of coherence matrix. This distribution is called a visual distribution. So the visual distribution is determined by two parameters. The first parameter is another positive definite matrix. And the second parameter is called degree of freedom. So degree of freedom must be a, like a bigger, no less than the dimension of your vectors. So, uh, here is the form. You are not again. You are not required to memorize this form. I cannot memorize as well. And it involves a multivariate gamma uh, gamma function. And uh, gamma uh, V sharp distribution can be considered as a multi-dimensional version of gamma distribution. It's a generalization of gamma distribution. So again, there's kind of a, a similar uh, counterparts. If a uh, matrix Lambda is sampled from a, a V sharp distribution, then its inverse follows the inverse V sharp distribution. So again, inverse V sharp distribution is often used as prior over the coherence matrix. If you want to assign a prior over the precision matrix, you use a V sharp. If you want to assign a prior over the coherence directly, you use inverse V sharp. So last. Uh, distribution you should be aware, I should know, is student t distribution. <laughs> student t distribution is usually also uh, roughly called like, infinite mixture of Gaussian distribution. Why? Uh, we'll say, right? Suppose we have a Gaussian random variable, which is when we first consider the uh, scalar case. Right? And uh, the Gaussian random variable, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the inverse, the, we denote the uh, inverse of variance by tau, right? So our precision by tau. And now if we assign a gamma prior over tau, just as we just introduced the gamma distribution, right? It is a, it can be used as a prior over the inverse variance of your Gaussian distribution. The question is that, what if I marginalize out this tau? 
what distribution can we have? So then we need to uh, integrate out this prior or tau, and then given tau, we have this Gaussian distribution, right? And it turns out that it will look like this. It's very complicated. Again, not necessary to memorize. And uh, we can further rewrite in a big in other forms. We can represent them in terms of nu and lambda. The nu is 2 times a. a and b comes from the gamma distributions parameters, and lambda is a over b. And then we rearrange this form. It becomes like this form, and then we call this form is the density of the student t distribution. And mu here is referred to as mean, and lambda is referred to as precision, and uh, nu is referred to as degree of freedom. But just keep in mind, student t distribution is just a, a sign of prior over the inverse variance of your Gaussian, just integrate out the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the precision. The marginal distribution will turns out to be the will be the uh, student t distribution. And uh, because we calculate density through this uh, integral, right? We go over all possible values of the precision. And each for each particular precision, you're weighted by this gamma distribution. That's why it's called infinite weighted sum of Gaussians. So what's the consequence of the infinite weighted sum of Gaussians? It's known to have this heavy tail property. So first, we can prove that when we take this degree of freedom new to infinity, then student t distribution converges to the gas distribution. But usually we don't have like finite finite uh, new, finite free of, uh, uh, degree of freedom, then student t distribution will typically typically put much more mass on the tails. That's why it's called a heavy tail distribution. Unless you enlarge new larger and larger and, and then it becomes it becomes more and more concentrated. So what's the benefit of the heavy tube problem? What is the benefit of heavy tube problem? It can provide more robustness when you do the estimation, especially when you did have, you know, did have some noises. So here's the example. So suppose those data points are sampled from some Gaussian distribution. There's no noises. That's a good, well-perfect Gaussian shape. So now you estimate the likelihood use T distribution or use Gaussian distribution, uh, you end up with almost the same density curve. So here, the red curve represents the, 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 the maximum likelihood estimation for Gaussian distribution, and the blue curve, uh, green curve, represents the T distribution. They overlap. You cannot see the difference. But difference comes when there are some noises corrupting, uh, corrupting your, your data. And if you use if you're still using Gaussian likelihood to do the maximum likelihood estimation, your Gaussian will uh, will suddenly will immediately become much much wider because it was uh, uh, influenced uh, largely by these noises. But if you still use T distribution to estimate, you still end up with this uh, well shaped curve. That means it's uh, much much less sensitive to the noises. That's why uh, uh, um, there are some research, actual research using T process to rubber to, to, to replace the Gaussian process. That comes the motivation mainly comes from robustness of the T distribution. Okay. And uh, so the last point. So if we really look at the uh, T distribution, it can be written as this uh, integral, right? And uh, now this is a gamma distribution. Now, if we uh, we write a and b in terms of the t distributions parameters, in terms of nu, uh, lambda, and uh, eta, then you can rewrite the density of t distribution as this integral, right? It's just a variable transformation. So now, if we further generalize it by replacing this lambda, scalar lambda, with a coarse matrix. No coherence matrix, a precision matrix for the multivariate Gaussian distribution. So now, after doing this integral, you end up with a, a multivariate student t distribution. 
And this is the form of the multivariate distribution. And be careful, in many textbooks, they won't give you the full formula. They only give you, say, mu equals to zero. That's not correct. And it's not, that's not used for probabilistic modeling or lazy learning. So if you want to use it, refer to this form. But again, you are not required to memorize this one. I cannot memorize it at all. I tried, I tried a few times. I tried 10 times. I failed. <laughs> so I, I, I decided not to memorize it forever. OK, so this is uh, uh, some uh, properties of the uh, multivariate student t distribution. Interestingly, if you want to have some uh, valid expectation of words, you have restrictions on the degree of freedom. So only when the degree of freedom is bigger than 1, you have expectation. Only degree of freedom, freedom is bigger than 2, you have this coerce. Again, similar to Gaussian distribution, multivariate Gaussian distribution, you also have a like conditional t distribution. If you have like a vector of variables, conditional on one subvector, what is the distribution uh, for the other part? So this is called conditional t distribution. I'm not going to introduce the details on that, but if you're interested, you can check out the papers here. Okay, we have a uh, go through, we have gone through those uh, common use of distributions, and uh, 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 I'm very happy that everybody feels comfortable about that. So we have gone through those common use distributions for binary categorical continuous finite variables. They are sufficiently to be used in our uh, future, uh, in our uh, in our own building of the new probabilistic models, and uh, uh, these are what you need to know. So for multivariate Gaussian distribution, you should need you should know how to derive condition distribution, marginal distribution by itself by using the uh, square completion trick. And uh, you should be aware, or should know, the common use of bar distribution of the distri distribution parameters. That means a uh, gamma distribution, v sharp distribution, beta and sharp distribution. And you should know how the t distribution is derived. And what's the benefit of t distribution? Uh -huh. uh, so I First section, you mentioned some of the additional resources that are supplemental to this. Um, which one of those resources relates directly to this? Yeah, yeah I will point out the uh, references. Actually, uh, I would encourage you to read chapter, I guess chapter 2 or chapter 1 in a pattern recognition machine learning book. I will give the link in the course web page. So when you guys download the uh, lecture slides, and uh, if you want to click into the lecture video, you will see the link. On the cost back page. Okay. See you on next one. And I think we should start with the whole of zero.